it strikes uh, around midday uh, on the 1st of September, 1923. All the seismological records show that it is one of the most major um, quakes to hit that part of Japan throughout the centuries. And the epicenter of the earthquake is not that far off the Japanese coast. So, the, so these areas were in close proximity. It strikes at a time when many Japanese were cooking, preparing their midday meal, which exacerbated the, um, the potential for a fire. And I think, they, I think the reports suggest that within about five minutes of the earthquake happening, fires had already erupted at around 15, 20 places across Tokyo. So it was not that you've got one fire which then spreads, like the Great Fire of London. You've got them springing up everywhere. And then, of co and then, and then ultimately, the extent of that was such that you've got these great firestorms and they're completely irresistible. If you look at the pictures that we have of the devastation, it's, 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 it's pretty horrendous. Um, so the fire claimed far more lives in both Tokyo and Yokohama than did the earthquake itself and the estimated death toll is we don't know exactly but it's everybody agrees that it's well over a hundred thousand and some estimates have said hundred and fifty thousand. As far as an economic historian is concerned I think there are there are a number of ways that you could play it. The way that's probably been most uh, pursued is what does this kind of disaster and destruction on this scale mean in terms of longer term growth trajectories? Does, the, does this kind of disaster pri provide an opportunity for sort of reconstruction, re retooling? You can, maybe you can make your industry more efficient. Um, an argument that has often been made with, in relation to the Japanese and German economies at the end of World War II. Um, but one thing that they have, have not really done, and which is what I'm most interested in, is what this kind of enormous exogenous shock does to the operation of markets for different items, different commodities. And in conjunction with that, what are the sort of psychological effects? What sort of response does it evoke from the people who participate in market interaction? And the reason why I think that's important is well, the re perhaps reasons, I think there are two. One is that I think that's where it becomes possible to extrapolate and say, well, if this happened in the Japanese case, then does that tell us something general about the psychology of markets and maybe that's possibly transferable. But in the more specifically Japanese case, all the work that's been done by economists and economic historians on the impact of the quake has tended to argue that in economic terms its effects are very short-lived and hence not terribly important. The macroeconomic indicators revert to trend within, in most cases, at the most two or three years. So it's on the one level it's very easy to say, well actually this is not a very important event, why bother? But on the other hand, if we look particularly at the more micro aspects, that will help us to understand why that happened. Because I think what happens over the two years after the earthquake, before, before the macro indicators revert to trend, probably help us explain why they do that. Um, because if you, for example, you, you envisage a two-year period during which there was complete mayhem, um, that's not going to revert to trend within two or three years. Um, so I think what happened during that short term is actually critical to understanding why overall the earthquake may have less effect on the economic trajectory of Japan than it might have done. Where I'm going at the moment is really sort of pursuing two avenues to do this. One is to look at what happens to the markets for particular commodities or items in the wake of the earthquake. Because if you think about it, the demand for some commodities is going to shoot up. Um, wood is a very good example. If you've got a destroyed capital area built of wood, then suddenly you're going to need more wood to rebuild it. And so what you would expect is the price 
shoots up, as long as the government doesn't try and set a ceiling on it. And all sorts of things are going to happen in that market. At the same time, the, price, the, the demand for other commodities is going to go down. If you've got a destroyed city, even the middle classes and the upper classes aren't going to go on buying luxuries on a large scale. Wood is interesting because it's produced across Japan, but they also import large amounts from North America. And so what the government does is it liberalizes imports from North America, huge amounts of North American wood come in and then the demand is saturated eventually and the price rockets up and down. So looking at those signs of things, I think it's, 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 it's micro in the sense of it's, looking, it's, it's, it's commodity oriented, but it's, it's how those markets are operating across, across the Japan as a whole. And I think that's, it's in respect to that also that the city of the port of Yokohama becomes very important because Yokohama is Japan's main export port. And so what all the exporters do is they move their business westwards to the port of Kobe. Kobe wants to keep what they've just got and Yokohama wants to rebuild and take it away from them again. So there's this very, very interesting debate in which which I think raises the whole issue of how far is some, one person's disaster or one area's disaster somebody else's opportunity. In the end, Kobe loses out. I think economics is often separated in people's minds from compassion. On the, I mean, there is an enormous degree of compassion. There's no question about it. And across Japan, and, and indeed across much of the world, people band together and donate goods and all sorts of things and to, to support the victims. Um, but when it comes to private trade, people have to make a profit. They have to make a living, they have to make a profit. Um, if you trade and give your goods away for free, you're not going to make a profit and you're not going to make a living. Therefore, you make decisions. Unless you carry on making a profit, you're not going to be good to anybody. You won't have the goods to be compassionate with, or the money to be compassionate with, if you don't make a profit. Um, you won't be able to employ people if you don't make a profit. Um, and those poor victims in Tokyo who've lost their jobs because their factory has been destroyed need to be employed. You know, I'm finding that one of the most interesting things which comes out of this often quite sort of prosaic literature is the psychology of how traders operate in particular, how traders, but how people in general Re respond to this. Many, many people in their, across Japan in their response to the quake, they want things to go, to go back to what they were before. They have an opportunity for change in many cases and in most cases they appear not to want to take them. And although in the Kobe case they, they see an opportunity and they think maybe they should try and take it, in general I think people are quite conservative and they want to you know, we had that and it seemed to work, so we've been through all, all this trauma, we'd like to go back to it.